Hello, I'm Zero CEO Jamie Burse, and welcome to the most impactful week in the movement to end prostate cancer. You now have exclusive access to informative and dynamic sessions, interactive presentations, and lots of downloadable educational materials. Plus, you can connect and chat with participants and presenters from wherever you are. Please join me right now for the virtual Zero Prostate Cancer Summit. Hi everyone, I'm Shelby Monier, Vice President of Zero's Patient Programs and Education. I hope you've enjoyed all of today's sessions. Today, our last session is going to be covering racial disparities of prostate cancer in black men. And we're going to give a special thanks to Viatris and Merck for sponsoring all of our sessions that cover health disparities in prostate cancer. So a huge thanks to those partners. Joining me this evening are Dr. Kelvin Moses and Dr. Arturo Holmes. Dr. Moses is co-chair of Zero's Racial Disparities Task Force and a member of Zero's Medical Advisory Board. He joins us from Vanderbilt University Medical Center. And with him this evening is Dr. Arturo Holmes, who he met at Vanderbilt and has mentioned uh, mentored over the years. So we're thrilled to hear both here. Um, Dr. Holmes is a senior urology resident at SUNY Downstate Medical Center in Brooklyn. Um, and some of you may know Dr. Holmes already from an amazing op-ed that was published last year in the Washington Post, and that was entitled, I'm a Black Doctor, I Wear Scrubs Everywhere Now. Um, we have posted a link to this op-ed for you in the description of this session. So Dr. Moses, Dr. Holmes, we're thrilled that you're here with us tonight, and we're really looking forward to our discussion. But before we begin, um, I'd love to just uh, hear your story and, and how you're connected and, and the mentorship and your relationship, if you wouldn't mind sharing. Good to be here. Thanks for having us. Absolute pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I actually met uh, Dr. Moses while I was rotating. <clears throat> before I started my third year rotations um, at, uh, at Meharian Medical College, um, I, I had had an interest in urology and I really wanted some direction on how best um, to, to help make that happen. And uh, Dr. Moses has been an absolute critical mentor in getting me from point A to point Z. So, you know, I just, you know, I, I, am, <laughs> I, I love Dr. Moses and respect everything that he has to say, so. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, we, we, we go way back, so that was, when he was at Meharry and I was chief of urology at National General Hospital. And so I had the chance to work with a lot of the medical students there. And um, Arturo was one of the first, maybe not the exact first, but one of the first students I got to work with. And now he's a thriving resident there in Brooklyn with one of my college classmates as, as his mentor there now. Oh, wonderful. Well, thank you both for sharing and thanks so much for being a part of the 2021 Zero Summit. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Good evening and thank you again for attending our session entitled Racial Disparities and Prostate Cancer for Black Men. I want to give a special thanks again to Zero for allowing us to have this forum and also for creating the Racial Disparities Task Force in prostate cancer uh, to be addressed by the members of uh, this talk, myself and Dr. Holmes, as well as others. Again, I'm Kelvin Moses. I'm on faculty at Vanderbilt University Medical Center in Nashville, Tennessee. And with me is Dr. Arturo Holmes, who's a senior urology resident at SUNY Downstate in Brooklyn, New York. These are my disclosures. So in this talk, what we will review are some of the basic facts about prostate cancer, and then delve into prostate cancer disparity in black men by reviewing some of the known literature and, and challenges. I'll briefly talk about the impact that COVID-19 had, uh, not only on prostate cancer, but in several cancers overall and, and the black population particularly. And then lastly, we'll discuss the role of social determinants of health in prostate cancer disparity, as well as the importance of clinical trials in the management of disease. So in 2020, there were estimated about 191,000 new diagnoses of prostate cancer in the United States. Uh, in fact, it ended up being quite a bit less and we'll, we'll talk about why that is. Uh, but the incidence has declined over the last several years, and that is due to changes in screening patterns. 
and the death rate have been declining uh, because of PSA screening. Uh, and in just the last couple of years, we've actually seen an uptick in death from prostate cancer. For the last several decades, nationwide data, including from the SEER database, shown that Black Americans have more than two times higher incidence of prostate cancer versus white men, and nearly two and a half times higher risk of death from prostate cancer. There are a lot of reasons that uh, impact the outcome from prostate cancer. The majority of it are social and economic factors, and, and that goes to the common term about accessibility insurance, as well as uh, the, the medical system overall providing less care for Black people historically and currently. Health behaviors do play a role and that does play some into lack of knowledge about prostate cancer as well as hesitancy about screening. And then smaller aspects include genes and biology, physical environment, and clinical care. But these all add up to how there's such a discrepancy between the outcomes between black men and white men in this country with prostate cancer. Now, the important thing to note is that race is not, is not a biological or medical entity. It's, it's truly a social construct. Uh, race is used as a way of defining people by, by population, by geographic distribution, by allocation of resources. Uh, and is used as a surrogate for a socioeconomic status, geographic origin, and culture. However, the search for a singular genetic base for every disease, including prostate cancer disparity, really diverts attention from uh, the true causes. Now, a genetic basis of, of investigation makes sense for geographically endemic diseases like sickle cell disease or cystic fibrosis that have clear genetic dispositions. However, uh, we have to otherwise conclude uh, that underrepresented po populations are genetically inferior if we ascribe a genetic basis for disparity in prostate cancer, colon cancer, breast cancer, heart disease, diabetes. And so really we have to focus on the system and how it treats uh, certain populations. So as I stated before, black men have about 2.4 times the risk of death from prostate cancer compared to white men. Black men are diagnosed at higher grade and stage, less likely to receive surgery versus radiation, and are more likely to develop cancer at a younger age. Overall, black men are less likely to receive screening for prostate cancer, and that includes the PSA blood test as, the, as well as the DRE or digital rectal examination and are consistently less likely to receive treatment at all, uh, either uh, watchful waiting uh, or suboptimal radiation versus radical surgery compared to white men. And this has been research has shown for now over 30 or 40 years. There's some emerging data that actually shows that Hispanic men are now having an increasing disparity in prostate outcome, prostate cancer outcomes. And as the Hispanic population grows, this, this issue will be exacerbated. Uh, Native American and Alaska Natives uh, have a greater mortality to incidence ratio for almost every cancer except for uh, liver. And it's most uh, pronounced in the screen detected cancers. And that includes cervical, breast, prostate and colorectal cancer. Uh, even uh, LGBTQ populations experience disparate rates of uh, breast cancer and prostate cancer. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with, uh, you know, fear of being outed by a physician or religiously affiliated facility. Uh, there's societal pressure to conform to gender expectations. Uh, and uh, there's disregard for the humanity of these people and there's actually legalized discrimination here in the state of Tennessee and multiple states, there are laws that are being passed that allow for a physician to discriminate against an LGBT patient based on so-called religious beliefs. So COVID-19 uh, has, has been a, an illuminating factor on the inequity within the healthcare system. And what it was, or what it still is, is an acute problem that has been placed on top of a chronic problem. 
So the acute problem is COVID-19 as far as the virus. The chronic problem are structural inequities within society in general, and in particular in the healthcare society uh, that, that have led to disparate outcomes with COVID-19, just like any other disease. Uh, New York has been one of the hardest hit locations. Uh, Dr. Holmes, do you mind like giving a little bit of perspective your, as your practice in Brooklyn? I know you see a lot of black men and Caribbean men, and you've also had to deal with COVID on large numbers. Can you give a little bit of a picture about what you're, you're experiencing there? So absolutely. COVID has really made us rethink how we treat patients, how we screen patients, how we care for patients. Um, you know, oftentimes we have algorithms that we follow as closely as possible to care for a patient. Um, however, you know, in, in the setting of COVID, um, we've seen access, you know, to care in, in certain patient populations, you know, face challenges um, where folks, you know, previously felt comfortable taking public transportation to get care. They may no longer feel comfortable doing that anymore. Um, they're more likely to, you know, not go to appointments or cancel show trees or things of that sort. So, you know, this is this is a real issue. Um, these are, you know, issues that we have been aware of. Um, it's just they're more present now. We just see them even more. Exactly, and uh, we're we're seeing now the third, fourth, fifth wave. Uh, fortunately, vaccines are now available, but will it will it reach the populations that need it the most? Um, and but part of that is that African Americans and in, increasingly Hispanics uh, made up a significant percentage of those who were sick enough to require hospitalization from COVID nineteen although African-Americans make up about 13% of the U.S. population. So as Dr. Holmes noted, uh, African-Americans were uh, particularly impacted by COVID in New York State and New York City. Uh, they represent 28% of deaths in New York City and 18% of deaths in the state, despite being 22 and 9% of the population respectively. We saw this in Louisiana. Uh, African Americans made up 70% of deaths from coronavirus while only representing about a third of the population. In Michigan, African Americans made up 40% of deaths in the state while making about 15% uh, of the population. And even in the city of Chicago, 70% of people who died from coronavirus were African American. So we're seeing really stark, stark numbers. And there's a lot of factors that play into that as well, just like as it played into prostate cancer. There's underlying systemic racism that is built into the healthcare system and has been acutely exposed during the pandemic. So barriers to access were acutely exacerbated. Uh, the, uh, the burden of, of comorbidity was exacerbated in the form of hypertension, diabetes, maybe other cancers. And so the African Americans and Hispanics in particular have higher likelihood of working what are termed essential jobs. Uh, the majority are not able to work remotely. Uh, and African American and Hispanic men tend to live in homes uh, with more people in the home or live in high density areas. As Dr. Holmes mentioned, there's lack of excess to testing and treatment due to lack of transportation. There are food deserts, which are a critical aspect of a person's health. The lack of access to fresh, healthy food and the overabundance of processed and packaged foods are detrimental uh, in terms of health. Uh, as, the, as I mentioned, other comorbidities uh, lead to worse health outcomes, such as hypertension, diabetes, uh, lung issues, obesity. And so there's this confluence of environmental education and employment racism uh, that is compounded uh, by policy issues uh, that, are, that are really uh, enacted by the government, such as neighborhood redlining and over-policing that are just uh, exponentially making these problems worse. 
there was some early information, misinformation, sorry, that African-Americans were somehow immune to COVID-19. And that may have led to some early uh, behaviors that ended up uh, exacerbating numbers as well. So what's happened in cancer diagnosis during the COVID-19 pandemic? In this publication from JAMA in uh, uh, mid-2020, as you can see for breast, colorectal, lung, pancreatic, and gastric cancer, uh, the baseline is the farthest left bar in each grouping. And you can see that cancer diagnoses fell off uh, over the several weeks as the pandemic was hitting. And uh, this was the same for prostate cancer. And it doesn't mean that fewer people had cancer, it just means that these people were going undiagnosed. And what we're seeing now that we're almost a year out is people are coming in with later stage disease, metastatic disease, who either missed appointments or missed screenings or just could not get in. And this is on top of trends that we're already seeing in prostate cancer due to changes in uh, screening, particularly due from the uh, 2012 United States Services uh, Preventive Services Task Force recommendation, uh, giving PSA screening a D grade. And so uh, in the last 10 years, we saw a steep decline in the diagnosis of localized cancer and an increase in regional and distant or metastatic disease. And so there was already this worrying trend uh, due to differences in PSA screening. And now on top of it, we've put decreased screening and treatment due to the COVID-19 pandemic. So what are men facing who, who deal with uh, prostate issues? And why do they not get screening or why are some uh, hesitant? Uh, part of it is uh, sort of like real estate, location, location, location. Um, a lot of men have a real mental barrier about being examined uh, below the waist uh, as, as part of the examination. And that's something where we have to sort of reassure men, you know, this is something women have been going through probably since they were 16 or 18 years old going to the doctor. And most men, if, if they haven't been seeing a doctor on a regular basis, probably went from you know, their pediatrician to their primary care doctor in their 40s or 50s when they start having other issues. Um, some men do assume that, uh, you know, examining or messing with the prostate will somehow result in loss of sexual function and, and problems with intimacy. Um, there's still a belief that a man uh, will die with prostate cancer than from it. Um, most men will uh, uh, die with prostate cancer if you get into your 70s and 80s. And certainly not everybody that has deadly, uh, has prostate cancer has a deadly version of it. But it still regards, uh, uh, needs regard from a physician in order to determine if there's cancer and if there is, what type there is. And it's personal. This is uh, something that men don't necessarily discuss. If, if we use the uh, analogy of women in breast cancer in the 60s and 70s, uh, it started to become much more of a public discussion than something that was shameful. And a lot of it was because one of the first ladies had breast cancer. And in her discussing that, it became a topic that was not taboo. And black uh, men in general, and certainly black men need to release that taboo about talking about prostate cancer and dealing with the issues that come with it. And then, uh, and particularly for black men, there's the, the role of trust uh, in the physician and in the medical system as a whole. Uh, and there is a reason and a absolutely justifiable reason for distrust. Um, the, the United States Public Health Syphilis Study at Tuskegee is certainly the most famous and probably the most talked about, but there's literally been hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of studies and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of unethical physicians performing uh, non-consensual uh, medical experimentation on Blacks, Hispanics, and Native Americans. And so th there is absolute justification for this. Another famous story is uh, that of Henrietta Lacks. Uh, she was a uh, Black woman living in, in Baltimore who had cervical cancer. And uh, during her uh, management at Hopkins, uh, her cells were taken. 
they were noted to be uh, immortal, meaning that her cells continue to grow in all uh, types of media. And now HeLa cells, uh, from her name, Henrietta Lacks, are used worldwide and responsible for untold advances in science and therapeutics. However, it wasn't really until the last five or 10 years that it was even known who she was and how she was treated while she was at Hopkins. Another issue is lack of diversity in the medical community. Uh, I believe in a, a talk that I just uh, attended, only 3% of physicians in the United States are African-American. And again, we, are, we make up about 13% of the US population. So there's, there's been plenty of research that shows that black patients have better outcomes, are uh, more likely to follow uh, instructions, more likely to be compliant with medication with a black physician. Same with Hispanic. White patients, however, receive the same quality of care no matter who their physician is. And so that, that uh, argues for the impetus of, of diversification of the, of the medical facility. So I wanna go a little bit into uh, clinical trials and research. And some of the things that one may ask when uh, pr approached about clinical trial participation is, or who are the researchers? Why is this research being conducted and why is it important? Uh, who will this benefit? Will it benefit myself or someone down the road? And then what, what systems are in place to ensure there are no hidden agendas behind the research and it is being uh, performed ethically? Uh, I'm gonna go back to this slide. You know, the, the things to look for uh, make sure that there is a data safety monitoring board. Uh, you want to make sure that this has been approved by the Institutional Review Board, known as the IRB. You want to look at who's conducting the study. Is this someone who's been in the community and has uh, been in communication and discussed this, or is it somebody out of the blue that you've never met before? Uh, so these are things that you, you want to discuss uh, Dr. Holmes, have you uh, uh, consented anybody for a clinical trial or ever discussed this with anyone and, and heard any concerns from, from people in the Brooklyn community? So as far as recent clinical trials, I have not done much consenting, but his, previously I have. Um, and this is something that, you know, not, not just with prostate cancer, but research in general, mm -hmm. um, there is, you know, folks... African-American folks can be a little bit leery about participating in, in research. And as you alluded to previously, there are multiple reasons why, you know, that have been documented um, that folks of all backgrounds know about. Um, however, what I found is if, is if you really take time to sit down and discuss kind of the intention of the study, um, how it can help them and, and folks beyond them um, and no matter what their background is, um, they're, they're usually, you know, if, they're, if there's some understanding, there's usually, you know, um, a desire to do whatever they can to help contribute to move things forward, so. Agreed, agreed, so important. And like I said, just sitting down, discussing it, getting, getting uh, an understandable level of, of what you're doing. And I think I found that a lot of patients are quite willing to and, and even ask about it if there's an understanding and a comfort. So as I mentioned at the outset, there are, there are social determinants um, that contribute to outcomes with uh, prostate cancer and many, and many other diseases. Um, stress is a huge, huge aspect of this. And I'm gonna bring Dr. Holmes back in. Um, it is stressful <laughs> being a black man in America. You, you can, uh, all you have to do is turn on the news and see another black man or woman being beaten or shot uh, by a police officer or watching uh, uh, people overrun the Capitol who previously criticized folks for saying that black lives matter in a protest. And um, uh, Dr. Holmes, I'll go back, you know, you, you gave a, uh, just a powerful um, uh, interview or editorial with the Washington Post about how you've had to carry yourself. And then subsequently you've given some, some TV interviews about 
uh, being a black physician and a black man in America. And just give us give us a little bit of, of kind of a summary of what you you've talked about in your experience. So in July of last year, I published an uh, a, an op ed in the Washington Post entitled "I'm a, I'm a Black Doctor. I Wear My Scrubs Everywhere," where I detail um, some of my experiences um, as a black physician. Um, navigating society, whether that is, you know, going to the grocery store, driving home from work, um, interacting with friends, what have you, there's, you know, a certain level of suspicion and concern that, that uh, surrounds you and kind of engulfs you wherever you go. Um, and depending on how you respond to that, you know, circumstances may become very unfavorable or deadly. Um, and I, I've spent some time talking about this, and I, I think this really speaks to kind of the undertones, kind of the, the, the experience that Black folks feel in general, um, things that we may or may not readily share, um, mm -hmm. but we do struggle through and are aware of, and may, in some cases, you know, color our decisions, mm -hmm. make us more likely or less likely to participate in things where others would, um, where we feel that others don't necessarily value our experience. Um, and I, I wrote that that article mostly to, to kind of share that because uh, kind of the way that it, it came to being was uh, George Floyd um, was killed. Um, prior to me writing that article in the wake of several, several other killings and uh, we as a, as a program had decided to discuss it and during that discussion, um, you know, I kind of shared what was the precursor to that article and several of my colleagues became, um, were moved by that. They were not aware of my own personal experiences and, I, and it really st stood out to me um, that folks can't take things into consideration that they don't know. Mm -hmm. um, and so I felt compelled to share that story, which is also part of the reason why I'm here, because I, I think it's important that, you know, we as, as physicians, especially as black physicians, um, as members of the community, you know, make efforts to include everyone, to show folks that everyone is concerned about this specific issue, as well as other issues. And, you know, it is worth your time. And we want to see the community thrive. Absolutely. And there, that really, uh, thank you for, for sharing that again. And, and that kind of flows into what we, we talk about, the circles of influence and network. Who are the people around you, you know, family, friends, coworkers, neighborhood, you know, the, 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 you know, segregation never really ended. It just got renamed. Uh, and, and so uh, sometimes the neighborhoods have been physically isolated if you look at the history of the interstate highway system, how it cut through and cut off black neighborhood, thriving black neighborhoods. And now that they are isolated, they have this lack of fresh food, lack of uh, access to healthcare, over policing. And so all of these, while not directly associated with prostate cancer or hypertension, uh, they play a role in, in how people survive with these uh, particular conditions. So what can we do to narrow the gap? And, and this uh, flows into the uh, efforts by Zero, uh, namely the Racial Disparities Task Force, uh, again, which uh, myself and Dr. Holmes are aware of, are uh, a part of. And we're, we're focusing on three pillars, education and awareness, and that's by forming partnerships with um, various organizations and, and, and schools uh, to increase awareness. Uh, clinical trial advocacy, and that's about increasing the awareness of clinical trials, but also ensuring div diversity within trial design enrollment uh, to reduce mistrust. And then financial assistance and patient support. And Zero has, has been a champion for this for years uh, and really just to, uh, increase the awareness about the financial tools that are available for men with cancer. Uh, we wish to have the health is wealth conversation. Uh, part of the uh, discussion will we'll, uh, go around uh, the 
the interconnectedness of health and the ability to uh, in, attain economic independence. Um, the task force also wants to encourage uh, black men to take ownership of health outcomes and really increase that discussion. And you know, there's been barbershop initiatives over the years and uh, different seminars. I mean, we wanna really be a support for that. Uh, and again, just encourage participation in clinical trials and research opportunities. And wasn't, won't necessarily affect you per se, if you participate, but improve the health for those that are coming behind you. I wanna thank everybody for your attention. I wanna thank Dr. Holmes uh, for his participation uh, and enjoy the rest of the meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, Dr. Holmes and Dr. Moses for joining us for the summit this evening. Um, what a timely discussion, as we all know. Um, and I am so thrilled that you were willing to share the personal parts of this, your journeys and of, of this story as it relates to a very important topic in prostate cancer. So uh, I want to thank you again on behalf of all of Zero and all of our summit attendees for being here with us. Um, virtually and hopefully in person next year. Thank you for being on our task force. We are so excited to get started um, and, and jumping into our three pillars that you touched on. So um, with that, I just wanna thank you both again for being here. Um, I'd like to take a moment to thank our sponsors, Merck and Viatris for making this content available. Such great sponsors of ours who are really, um, really passionate about health equity as a we at zero. So to our attendees, we still have two days of great content in store for you um, for our 2021 summit. So for more information on our summit and any additional topics, please visit zerocancer.org. And thanks again, Dr. Moses and Dr. Holmes. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. The issues you care about most are right here at the Virtual Zero Prostate Cancer Summit. Please check out the other topics, sessions, and virtual get-togethers in your summit app. Remember, you are not alone. Join the Zero community to gain support and more information on prostate cancer at zerocancer.org.